Okay, this is chapter 21 of the book God dictated to me, of two books actually, Isaiah 53 and the day of the Lord, just as he did with Moses in the Torah. We know Moses couldn't have known Genesis and he couldn't have known Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He had to be told and instructed, commanded, Moses, write this down. Now go and tell the Israelites. It's pretty much is what he's done with me. I'm telling the Jewish people right now. And uh, he dictated the entirety to me. Every bit of it is his. These are God's words. They're new. It's a new book. Doesn't read like the Bible reads. You know, it's not an antiquity. Uh, we're not a society of illiterate people. And they were men. No schools. Uh, the main entertainment was storytelling. No story bigger than the story of Jesus. But uh, that's on other videos. Okay, 21 is called Rashi and his commentary on Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. Now, there's an introduction to it that's quite long. And it's basically almost three parts. So, the actual commentary of Rashi and myself will probably pick up on another tape. But it's 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 you have, it, it it follows to get into fifty two verse by verse and fifty three. You need to know these things I'm about to read to you. In Isaiah fifty two thirteen, the Lord begins to describe his righteous servant of chapter fifty three. Isaiah fifty two thirteen through fifteen should have been verses 1 through 3 of chapter 53. When scripture was originally written, there were no chapter and verse uh, divisions. A Jewish rabbi by the name of Nathan divided the Hebrew Bible into verses in 1448. Some of the chapter divisions of the Hebrew Bible are very arbitrary. It is commonly believed that Isaiah 53 starts in the final verses of Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, a chapter of prophecy fulfilled by the return of the remnant of all 13 tribes of Israel got off <coughs> of Israel. God often calls his servant, and it concludes with verse 12. Multiple verse quotations. The translation of Art Scroll and Shabbat of Isaiah 52 that Rashi comments on does not include the quotations that combine verses 13 through 15. They are the only quotations of Isaiah 52 and a demarcation of the verses of the fulfillment of prophecy by the return of the remnant of the 13 tribes from exiles. This is the exiles. And, uh, of course, they, they built the second temple as a holy seat. In Isaiah, God forgives their sins and remembers them no more. And I have a covenant right now from Jeremiah 31 that does the exact same thing. It's just a repeat story. And of course, there's a temple to be built by a holy seed. Covenants has to be delivered. How'd you get the first one? Moses. How are you going to get the second one? Prophet like Moses. He's described in Isaiah 53. One man's described. There's only there's only six prophecies unfulfilled in this last page of the prophets. Malachi three. Four righteous servants to come. See, a time is coming for righteous servants. But there's only one description. 
And that description is my life. It's me. God orchestrated my life of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, bad things happening to me, afflicted by God. Afflicted means um, you're born blind, deaf, lame, crippled, or disfigured. I was born disfigured. I have no right breast, my right shoulder is shorter than the left. Uh, and it plays into 52, 13 through 15. They are the beginning, 13 through 15, of the description of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 and have nothing to do with the exiles. God's servant, the Jewish people, God's righteous servant is a Gentile in the beginning. I says, God had me type that, so I think that means I will convert. Uh, I started converting here in Houston. My father had a heart attack and I had to stop the classes for a few weeks. I, after a couple of weeks, I could have gone back and God said, no, that's good. You know, I went to the high holidays. I went to synagogue, um, a Shabbat dinner or two, and uh, it was great. Really loved it. Loved hearing um, the, the, uh, the singing just about it in Hebrew. Couldn't understand a word, of course. I don't speak Hebrew. God has had me for 16 years, and he, <laughs> I don't know why he doesn't just go ahead and teach me. I got all the books for it, and there's videos on it. He likes to do things at the last moment. He says, well, when you know everything, you know what's going to happen. It's always more fun to wait to the last minute. So, anyway, God wants to have fun. That's okay with me. In the beginning, the translation of the JPS, Jewish Publication Society, has the quotations. And uh, they had uh, multiple experienced linguistic experts and three uh, rabbis from Orthodox, Conservative, Reform. And they spent over, it started in 55 from the original Leningrad Codex. Uh, a lot, of the, I think the reason Shabbat and Art School, they don't have the quotations, is because they got taken out a long time ago. Some of these Bibles that are used today uh, either went to uh, Hebrew to Greek to English, or sometimes uh, they just worked on do we have the right interpretation and change things. But anyway, it's a big change, particularly to the commentary of Jews for Judaism on uh, Isaiah 53. Makes a big difference because it's the only place you see the word exalt. Now, it doesn't say the world. And what they're talking about is the exiles. The exiles were exalted for building the second temple. It's not what he thinks it is. Ramban just made it up, and these rabbis just, they teach his word as strongly as they teach God's. He said, oftentimes, if you teach man's word, like the Messianic era, world exaltation, the world will speak Hebrew, Moshiach will perfect the world, we will know he's Moshiach if he builds the temple. <laughs> I can't do it by myself. That's how you're going to know, huh? That and a resurrection of the dead. Well, I've been here uh, 66 years, the last 16 with God and the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, who is a person. And I uh, hadn't seen any reports of real zombies walking around. Or people appearing from the ground, and and if you, and here's a hint. This is, this is a good example of you have to be able to tell what's written for antiquity and what's written for today. What needs to be looked at again uh, for interpretation, because in antiquity they believed in resurrection of the dead. They didn't even know what a spiritual heaven was. You know, all they knew is God was angry all the time, and they didn't really think about spending time with him. <laughs> uh, chapters 1 and 10 of Ezekiel show you the spiritual heaven. 
the eyes on the wheels of the wheel works going to and fro at northeast, west, south, um, with angels and or cherubs and or creatures on top, gathering eyes. There was eyes on them too, on their wings at least. Uh, the eyes of the Jewish people. That's what they're, they're picking up the spirits of the Jewish people. That's what they're doing. Because in 10, the wheel works rises up to the house of God. Some would call it the platform of God. And God is there above them. And, they, you know, presumably they get unloaded. They're in heaven now. Whereas Ezekiel 37, God says to Ezekiel, let's go to the uh, Valley of Bones, I think it is. And he says, Ezekiel, say this. And Ezekiel says, rise, old bones, rise. And they did and then out of nowhere, <laughs> muscle and tissue, I guess eternal organs come flying into these skeletons and skin and uh, they're, they're persons, they're Jewish people again, alive. Okay, not going to happen. Okay, but that worked for antiquity and most people can't figure out one in ten anyway. Why? I don't know. But anyway, they're not gonna be that's not a sign of me to come, and you're not gonna see me build a temple by myself. And if I don't get those books published, and it's again, it's trying to straighten Judaism out. Get out of antiquity and get to the uh, the enlightenment, a time today of reasoning, knowledge, information, science, medicine. I think very few people believe in the resurrection of the dead, but I know that it's the 13th fundamental principle uh, put put together by Ramban. And the 13th is you have to have the belief in the resurrection of the dead. Well, that just needs to be changed. You have to believe in the spiritual heaven. Pretty easy. Um... So, carrying on, this is 13 of 52. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He's talking about me right now, because I am the man of Isaiah 53, and it starts at 13, 14, and 15 of 52. My servant, now he does use my servant, and that's what he generally calls the Jewish people, shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up. And he shall be very high. 14. As many wondered about you. Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know. Something happened to you. Bear with me. Translation of the Jewish Publication Society has the quotations. It's 13, 14, and 15. Well, I'm just going to read it. I mean, God had me talk of uh, <clears throat> following the quotations. 13, Behold, my servant shall prosper, he shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be very high. 14, As many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of man, and his features from that of people. 15, That would be my disfigurement, believe it or not, because then this, He shall cast down many nations, Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For what had not been told them, they saw. That would be me. Nobody's expecting me. And at what they had not heard, they gazed. That would be all this information, this knowledge that's in this book. Okay, here's the actual 13. I guess... We had a little summary of it from the JPS. Everything in this book is from the JPS, any scripture. 
Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great. In, oh, this is with the quotations. Uh, indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. 14. Just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. Close quotations. My servant is now the Gentile and the exiles who becomes, and not the exiles, who becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after pass, passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10, when he makes himself an offering for guilt. In a covenant with God, Isaiah 53 then begins with a new multiple verse quotation that is missing the quote that is missing the quotes from the translation of Art School and Shabbat, but included in the translation of the Jewish Publication Society. So this is 53.1. And it begins with a quote, and the quote ends at the end of verse 6. Who would have believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And he came up like a sapling before it. And like a root from dry ground, he had neither form nor comeliness. And we saw him it and we saw him that he had no appearance. Now shall we desire him? Despised and rejected by men, of men of pains and accustomed to illness, and as one who hides his face from us despised, and we held him of no account. And I can assure you, particularly if I join any groups and bring any of this up, just suggesting, you know, it could be talking about Elijah. <laughs> and what are the quotes? Yeah, they kicked me out. They didn't like what I was saying. That's not what it told you, it says. That's what you get. Yeah, go look at how he backs it up. It's pathetic. who hides his face from us, despised, and we held him of no account. Indeed, he bore our illnesses and our pains. He carried them. Yet we accounted him plagued, smitten by God and oppressed. That would be, that can be afflicted. But that actually shows up later anyway. And oppressed. But he was pained because of our transgression, crushed because of our inequities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him. And with his wounds, we were healed. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he would not open his mouth. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he would be brought. And like an ewe that is mute before her shears, and he would not open his mouth. Again, all those words do apply to me, but it's to become the righteous servant. The people in verse 1 through 6 are sinners, and they feel guilt. So I offer myself to for guilt, but it's really to remove guilt by making them righteous. If they believe in me and they believe God's here, they're going to go back to synagogue. They're going to get it straight. And when they hear what heaven's about, which only I can teach, and it's in this book. Uh, it's where I learned some of it. God just said, write this down. I was learning as I typed. But um, it's probably, I, I suspect God explains all this as I go on, if I just stick to his words. Okay, verse 1. Okay, that was our scroll and Shabbat. And then I repeated 
in the quotes of the Jewish Publication Society. I'm not going to reread it. Uh, hid his face from us and did not talk. You find it in Ezekiel. It's the key to 53. Ezekiel, go to your house. I bind you with the cords of my power and you shall not go out amongst the people. Now that's verse 8. He was cut off from the land of the living. Well, Ezekiel just got cut off. Can't go. That's what cut off means. It doesn't mean he died. It doesn't mean he was cut off from living. No. And silent his lamp. Well, he wasn't talking to anybody. <laughs> He's bound by God's cords and slammed to the ground, bruised and crushed, and has to lay on one side with his hands handcuffed behind him with God's power. The cords of God's power. Which I'm also for, oh, so familiar with. I tell him all the time, you know, absolute power corrupts. <laughs> it makes him laugh. That's him laughing through me. Now, he can speak through me, too. Just like the man who wrestled with Jacob, he's a man in divine beings also. As the spirit that lights upon you and enters you, you instantly become a man in divine beings. Every one of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible were men in divine beings because that's how God talks to a man. He enters you along with the spirit. And then you can hear his words. That's what Ezekiel said. God was talking to me at that moment. A spirit see, uh, entered me. That had been the Holy Spirit, the angel of his presence. And God. And then I could hear God's words. Which were, Ezekiel, get up <laughs> upon your feet. I'm thinking, he just slammed into the ground, didn't he? Because that's pretty much what he did to me. Oh, yeah, it makes you angry. It makes you sad. It, maltreatment by God is just awful. But it does change you. It does change you. I'm not the same man he started with. Okay, so I'm not going to reread that. The speaker is no longer God from the Isaiah 52 multiple verse quote but it's the witnesses. There's three speakers between 52 and 53. But it's the witnesses of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. Multiple quote verse that follows. The witnesses who are the Jewish people, who are Jews, identify themselves as one of the many made righteous by God's righteous servant, saying, It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering he endured. It's verse 4. He was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our inequities. Verse 5. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. Verse 5 also. The Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. Verse 6. And see offering for guilt in 53.10. The quotes, beginning at verse 1 and ending before verse 7, identify the speaker of verses 1 and 2 as also being witnesses made righteous by the righteous servant from the suffering he endured. God's fire of refinement. You've heard me talk about it before if you're keeping track with these chapters. Um, I call it God's boot camp for prophets. Uh, he does all these, all those words are part of being in the fire of refinement. All of them. God's teaching, the teachings, is that no man bears the suffering of others. It is not even possible to bear the sin, wounds, chastisement, bruising, sickness, and suffering of others. It can't happen. No one, no one or others can be healed or atoned for because another man or men suffer or are beaten, murdered, or sacrificed. So what are these verses by the witnesses about? The sickness of the witnesses is not being righteous. 
this is now in God's words. I was kind of ad libbing to uh, before I got to it. Just because I, sometimes I think he needed it earlier than when he puts it there. But of course, he's right and I'm wrong. Okay, so it's it's because they're not being righteous. God's righteous servant suffers by the chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, and maltreatment and wounding too, laid on by laid on him by the words and power of God to make him suitable for his purpose that might prosper. A pro, a purpose that includes the righteous servant making the many righteous by his knowledge with long life in the building of the third temple. The Christians take these same words and say they mean the crucifixion of Jesus and the scourging, and they are made righteous and free by his blood. Knowledge with long life and written sin forgiveness, not death, and sin forgiveness by human sacrifice and blood. He's written it down twice. It's in Isaiah for the exiles who returned, pursuant to his prophecy, the remnant shall return, and, and, Jeremiah 31. It's basically a covenant of sin forgiveness, and it's a confirmation of the original covenant. I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will follow my commandments, laws, and rules. Strictly. A righteous servant bearing up to this fire or fire is bearing the illness and pain of unrighteousness of the Jewish people to be recognized as a prophet of God that in and of itself will draw the Jewish people back to Judaism, recounsel the family members one to the other, and make the many righteous in the day of the Lord. Now, I mentioned four righteous men. One description, that one man is me. I fit the description. I assure you, he made sure of it. He was with me at birth, but didn't let me know until I was 50 years old. And uh, I'm also the only man who can fulfill 5310 that you can find. Crushed with disease, exposed to death, but given long life. Lung cancer, untreatable. Month to live, death sentence. Never saw a doctor again. Just left dazed, I guess, or in denial. I didn't really feel like I was going to die. God said, told me, he said, I may have had a little bit to do with that. But um, here I am. That was when the planes hit New York 22 years ago. Exposed to death, but given long life, he shall see his children. I have three, and I have seen them. They don't talk to me anymore because I don't believe in I believe Jesus is a myth. You know, it's kind of, you know, politics and religions can really break a family up. They don't, they don't keep in contact like they used to. But, you know, I just, I have no self-will. It's not up to me to pick up a phone and call them. I can't say, you're not going to call my kids. And God would say, what did you just say? You're going to do something? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> no, you're not. If you pick up a phone and call it's because I'm having you do it. He can communicate with you without words. He can just put knowledge into your mind. You know, once he's inside of you, he controls your mind, your thoughts. He makes sure you know you're still Keith. <laughs> Even though he says you still have to experience the human, have to go through the human experience in mind, my response is, why? I don't know that I'm still human. I, I'm like a puppy. <laughs> but anyway, carrying on. Oh, but it's Elijah in Malachi 3 who recounts the family through Judaism. Okay? But in 53, it's the righteous servant who makes the many righteous. Well, they're both doing the same thing. And that's just, you know, gives more credence to one description, four righteous servants. Elijah, prophet like Moses, which I've covered with this book, the most unique thing about him, the book dictated to me, as Torah was written, uh, dictated to him, and uh, Moshiach himself, that, that comes more along with building the third temple.